Hello and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Kate. I'm Laura. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get people talking. Today, we've got not one, not two, but three book club books to talk about. The first is on everyone's radar, thanks to winning this year's Booker Prize, and that is The Seven Moons of Marley Almeida by Shahan Karnatilla. For once, both judges and readers were united in praise for this ambitious novel about the bloodiest period of Sri Lanka's civil war. Every year, my book club duly reads the Booker winner, and I'll be reporting back on what they made of this one. Our next book is a slim novel that has quietly been building a word-of-mouth buzz, helped by enthusiastic reviews from literary world influencers. My Phantoms by Gwendolyn Riley explores the psychological battleground between a semi-estranged mother and daughter, and it was read by my book club earlier this fall. What did we think of it? And should you be seeking it out? And because we love nothing more than to bring you value, we're also catching up with Laura's book club's latest read, Eight Months on Gaza Street by Hilary Mantel a suspenseful novel that draws heavily on Mantel's own experiences of living in Saudi Arabia. Laura is fresh from the discussion last night, and so we're going to bring you her book club's hot take. That's all coming up here on the Book Club Review. Kate, it has been some time since we've had a book club episode, so I'm excited to get back to our roots. I love our book club episodes. They always feel like coming home to me. They're kind of home yeah. turf. Yeah. <laughs> Especially because I somewhat feel like an expert when we talk about our book club books, having read them in some depth, discussed them in some depth. I kind of feel like I know what I'm talking about more than, I don't know, some of our other episodes. Well, even our listeners might feel they know what we're talking about when it comes to this one, because we did discuss Seven Moons of Marley Almeida when we did our Booker Prize show with Chrissy Ryan and Phil Chafee. At the time, it was the one that we all tipped to win. We all, I remember, really liked it and responded really strongly to it. Although listeners will also know that I was very swayed by Treacle Walker by Alan Garner. (laughs) <laughs> but Seven Moons is the one that won. My book club always read the winner. So that was a natural fit for us. I was really intrigued to see what they would make of it. So we had a very rare in-person meetup the other week at my house. People were coming in from Devon and Dorset because during lockdown, many of my book club actually moved out of London, moved away. And so it was really lovely. People made a real effort and actually came back so that we could have a meeting in person. So that was just so nice. But anyway, listeners don't care about that. There was a last minute scarlet fever crisis that meant that we ended up having it at my house rather than my friend Coco's house. But she heroically made us all this incredible Sri Lankan curry. And so I went and picked that up. And so we had this delicious food that I hadn't had to make. So I was happy there as well. And I have to ask, is scarlet fever an expression or did some small child have scarlet fever? It's a thing that's going around in the UK. It's quite a worrying issue at the moment because it's going through the schools. It sounds absolutely terrifying. You know, it's isn't the one I that... I just think of Little Women. That's right. And you think, oh my God. <laughs> so I'm like, do people still get scarlet fever? Yeah, really? most Gosh. of the time, apparently, it is fairly mild and not anything to worry about, but it can become serious. And so it is of concern. Anyway, so it meant we couldn't go to Coco's house, but mm-hmm. we had it at mine and that was very nice. And we talked about Seven Moons. So for any listeners who didn't follow the Booker Prize the Seven Moons of Mali Almeida is by Sri Lankan author Shahan Karnatilika. He's someone who's also worked in the advertising world. He's done some screenwriting. This is, I think, his second novel. The main character is actually dead when we meet him. And he's reporting back from the afterlife where he has found himself with no idea of how he got there. He doesn't know how he died. And from his ghostly perspective, he tracks back over his last few days and the encounters with friends and enemies. He was in life a photographer. And so in his afterlife, he's also preoccupied with some missing negatives that show images he took, which could potentially expose corrupt leadership figures in Sri Lanka and change the political landscape of Sri Lanka. So there's a whole thing in the book about various different people trying to get hold of these negatives. And Marley, you know, as a ghost is, is, is wondering, you know, can he possibly influence things and help them come to life. Before his seven moons, there is a sort of time constraint. In this afterlife, it turns out that you have seven moons to resolve any issues that you're carrying with you from your life. 
before something happens. We don't quite know what before the next stage is reached. And so there's several things that are pulling you through this book. There is this sort of who done it element trying to figure out who killed Marley, how he ended up dead in the first place. There is also this sort of detective story, I suppose, trying to track down these negatives and figure out where they've been hidden and can they be shown and exhibited in the way that will hopefully mean that some good comes of him having taken them. And finally, this question of his own soul, which hangs in the balance, what's going to happen to him, how are things going to turn out? So there are lots of things that make this book quite propulsive. And the writing is one of those things. Let's get a sense of that. The audiobook is narrated by Shavantha Wijisna and published by Belinda Publishing. Here's a clip. You wake up with the answer to the question that everyone asks. The answer is yes. And the answer is just like here, but worse. That's all the insight you'll ever get. So you might as well go back to sleep. You were born without a heartbeat and kept alive in an incubator. And even as a fetus out of water, you knew what the Buddha sat under trees to discover. It is better to not be reborn. Better to never bother. Should have followed your gut and croaked in the box you were born into. But you didn't. So you quit each game they made you play. Two weeks of chess, a month in Cub Scouts, three minutes in Rugger. You left school with a hatred of teams and games and morons who valued them. You quit art class and insurance selling and master's degrees. Each a game that you couldn't be asked playing. You dumped everyone who ever saw you naked. Abandoned every cause you ever fought for. And did many things you can't tell anyone about. If you had a business card, this is what it would say. Mali Almeida. Photographer. Gambler, slut. If you had a gravestone, it would say Malinda Albert Kabbalana, 1955 to 1990. But you have neither, and you have no more chips left at this table, and you now know what others do not. You have the answer to the following questions Is there life after death? What's it like? Shivantha Wijisna, I have to say, if you look him up, is an extremely attractive man. Anyway. <laughs> it, was he featured on the Booker Instagram feed? I think he's... Perhaps performing I, the, well, I think uh, he's the a, book? I think he's a singer as well. So anyway, it was just funny to me when I looked him I up. I was like, oh. the same man. <laughs> there was an extraordinarily handsome man performing The Seven Moons of Malia Maida on the Booker feed in the lead up to the award ceremony. Yeah. Because <laughs> I thought, I was like, oh, is that the author? Oh, no, it's not the author. I mean, we should oh, say... He's quite handsome yeah, too. Yeah, he is actually, isn't he? And he's very charismatic. That's what I thought about him. I am very curious to hear what your book club thought of this one, because I have an ongoing confession. I felt like I made this confession last time. I have still not finished this book. For all of the propulsiveness you speak of, somehow it just didn't hook me. And I am even at that point, Kate, where I am wondering if I just didn't join the pack on our Booker episode. Maybe there was some criticism I needed to offer, given that I like it, I admire it, but I'm not I haven't finished it. Mm, interesting, because I would say it's a slow start and it's quite a difficult read at the beginning because there is a lot of violence and you have to get used to that and be okay with reading that. And many people might just not be prepared to go through that. I do my main reading before I go to bed at night and it wasn't something I really wanted to curl up in bed with. But I did stick with it. And I would say as these plot mechanisms kick in, it does then become much more of a page turner mm. because you're curious about these things and that I carries know. you through. Or well, certainly that was my experience. But I did get to 70%. I think one problem might just be that I'm reading it on my Kindle and I am quite bad at getting through books on my Kindle. I feel like the Kindle has this distancing effect. I think the other thing is that the tone is so sardonic. And now thinking back to my experience of reading it, it's almost like reading a graphic novel because his language is so graphic and the imagery is so surreal and you have these ghosts and souls and creatures and demons. It's very visceral and a bit 
alienating from the characters and from the plot even. So maybe that's it. But that's why I want to hear what your book club thought. Did anyone not finish it? Or am I the outlier? Well, that's really interesting. So most of us did finish it. It's interesting you say about the distancing because I think there's a few things going on there. One is this thing that it's all written in the second person. So it's you do this, you go here, you choose to do this, which in some ways makes it more direct because as a reader, you're really being placed in this position of agency and choice, so to speak. But in another way, is a bit alienating. It's a very good point because I remember when we talked about it last time, I had almost forgotten that it was in the second person because you do sink into it and it just washes over you. And yet, nonetheless, I think there's consequences to that literary decision in terms of how the reader interacts with this character, how they understand the character. He talked about being inspired by the choose your own adventure books that we all grew up with. Another aspect of the sort of distancing is that Marley, the main character, is a photographer. And so in his afterlife, he has a physical camera that's part of his ghostly persona. I suppose it's not a physical camera, but, you know, a... <laughs> ethereal camera, which he often uses to see things. Often as a device, he's looking through the lens of this camera. And Coco talked about the way that a lot of the violence for her, it made it easier to kind of read that because there's this sense of witnessing it, documenting it, but with a photographer's detachment, that idea that mm. very often photographers are in very compromised positions because they're in the thick of the action. And yet their role is not to step in and help or change things. Their role is to be there, to document, to just be eyes. And so for Coco, that was really helpful. But other people found it the opposite. They felt like this idea of this forensic lens zooming in on these things made it harder to read. You were not alone. You would perhaps not be surprised to know that Andy, your old friend Andy, was on your side in that he said for 90% of the book, this is a story about unpleasant people doing nasty things. And it's very hard to really root for anybody or care about any of the characters. Although he was fair-minded enough to acknowledge that at the end, he said for him, the last 10% of the book is what carried it for him. And so in our little score system, we give them out of five. And he ended up giving it four because he said he thought the writing was excellent. Many things about it were really accomplished, the pacing and how it was done. But he just didn't like reading it that much mm. and for him mm. that, that that mattered you know that made a difference that's so interesting a funny aside i've been talking about hbo programming with my colleagues at work and how i don't like white lotus and i don't like succession because i don't like to watch television about usually i swear but we'll say unpleasant people doing unpleasant things and so maybe that was my problem with this book is that i just wasn't emotionally connected enough i don't mind flawed people doing unpleasant things now, that said, I don't know that Molly is that. He's a bit of a scoundrel. He's certainly unfaithful to his devoted boyfriend, but I don't know if he's that terrible. Yeah, we talked about how Molly represents this, you know, the capital Colombo, this sort of bourgeoisie elite. He's got plenty of money. He's going off to casinos and nightlife. And we liked the way that that meant it felt like Colombo was this bubble, you know, a separate world from what was going on in the rest of the country. It was all mad and eccentric, but it felt quite relatable. It could have been New York or London. You know, in some ways that all felt like something we could relate to. At the same time, a couple of people found the character of Marley, you know, he's a sort of promiscuous gay character and... And a bit predatory, yes, I would say. Yes, Absolutely. There's nothing wrong with being promiscuous. All power to you. But he's quite deceptive. He's seducing young men. There's a bad edge to it that is predatory. That was the issue. And Andy Kay, my other Andy, just said he just didn't feel comfortable reading that. He just found this main character quite problematic. There's a lovely bit in the book about a pangolin, which is an animal very rare that's native to Sri Lanka, I think. And we talked a bit about pangolins because Andy, it turns out, has seen a pangolin in real life. Apparently they're nocturnal. They're quite difficult to spot. And he was apparently with a Polish woman in Ghana. And she said, I think I see something over there in that bush that looks a bit like the mouldy potato I have at the bottom of my fridge. And Andy said, that's a pangolin. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's funny. He's very into the natural world and always coming out with interesting things about animals and plants that he knows that none of the rest of us doesn't. I just like that he'd really seen a pangolin. 
And so overall, do you think the seven moons held up against past winners? Did you guys talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think the feeling was that this was one of their favorites of previous book of years. We had a little think about Lincoln in the Bardo which has very obvious elements that compare the whole idea of being set in the afterlife. And for Amanda, that was a flawless book for her. And she said she felt this wasn't that. She still really liked it. She gave it, I think she gave it, yeah, four and a half stars out of five. Slightly more flawed than Lincoln in the Bardo, but streets ahead of Shuggy Bane and The Promise. <laughs> she said the way <laughs> Carnatilica creates the whole world of the afterlife was amazing. But she wasn't so comfortable with the gambling thread, which she found a bit unconvincing in terms of the effect it would have had on his life. Mostly four stars. And yeah, people who did read it really got a lot from it. Sally said it helped her to make sense of the complete madness and chaos of Sri Lanka at that period in time. She's read other things set there and found herself confused and slightly overwhelmed trying to make sense of everything. And she said what she loved about this book is she felt like this book acknowledges the chaos and that there was no clear definitions between good and bad, and that everyone was to some extent compromised. And for her, she found that really helped her make sense of it all. And she found it a really engaging read. She said she zipped through it. The Booker Prize winner she's enjoyed the most for several years. Mm. So yeah, it was a hit. I was happy we did it. All right, good. Well, you never know. If I can get my hands on a print copy, I think that could be the push I need <laughs> to finish it. Then I can report back. All right, changing gears and on to something entirely different in tone and content, My Phantoms by Gwendolyn Riley. Gwendolyn Riley is an author living in London, born in London. And as I understand it, she has been writing these slim taut novels for some years now and quietly building up a reputation, as we said in our intro, with reviewers. I hadn't heard of her. This was a recommendation from Francis in my book club, who actually has a link to Gwendolyn Riley through a former colleague. And she referenced that when she recommended the book, but wouldn't give us anything else. She's like, no, no, we got to read it first. My Phantoms is the story of Bridget Grant and her mother, Helen or Hen Grant. And it's really about their relationship with some looking back in time to Bridget's childhood. Her parents were divorced at that time, and there's these harrowing passages of her being sent off with her father, who's this sort of, uh, oh, I'm sure there's all sorts of British stereotypes that would sum up her father, but they're not coming to the tip of my tongue. A bit of a geezer. But really, then we transition because her father is now dead. Bridget's in her 30s, maybe early 40s, and her relationship with her mother is changing as her mother ages. They're only seeing each other once or twice every year. They're not talking for months at a time. And when the novel begins, I at least was very firmly in Bridget's corner, especially because you're hearing about her childhood and what her mother was like and her mother's disengagement, both emotional, but also physical, that she would just turn away from her children. Sometimes if pressed on a question, she'd cover up her head with her hands and turn away. This is a total emotional and physical retreat from her two young daughters. But then as the novel unfolds, we get to know our narrator a bit more. And I say that we don't get to know about her life. We don't get to know about her work. We don't even really get to know about her partner, although he features briefly. This is such a close study of a mother-daughter relationship. And it's in their interactions that we get to know the narrator and begin to question her version of events and also how culpable she might be in this dysfunctional push-pull we do have a clip. The audiobook is narrated by Helen McAlpine. Her antipathy to her circumstances was no spur to change. I think it was the opposite, in a way, back then. My mother loved rules. She loved rules and codes and fixed expectations. I want to say, as a dog loves an airborne stick. Here was unleashed purpose, freedom of a sort. Here, too, was the comfort of the crowd and of joining in, of not feeling alone and in the wrong. In conversation, or attempted conversation, her sight seemed set on a similar prize. She enjoyed answering questions when she felt that she had the right answer, an approved answer. I understood that when I was very small and could provide the prompts accordingly. Then talking to her was like a game or a rhyme we were saying together. You hated being an only child, didn't you? I might say. And she would say, 
Oh, yes, I hated it, yes. And after I had Michelle, I knew I had to have another baby because I always vowed I could never have just one. I think it's cruel to have just one. Or, oh, what was your school uniform? I would ask, not for the first time when I was reading the list of things I needed for mine. Well, it was navy blue, the same, and you had a different coloured tie for each house, and I was Windsor, which was yellow. Only we had to wear a hat, and every day I had to run past the orphanage morning and afternoon, because they used to throw stones and run after you when they saw anyone from the grammar. And one day, I lost my hat. She painted a beguiling picture, if you were susceptible to that kind of thing. Lonely, only child. Breathless little girl who had to do this and had to do that. I was not susceptible. But then, nor did I ever quite feel that I was the intended audience when she took on like this. There was some other figure she'd conceived and was playing to. That's how it felt. Somebody beyond our life. What did you make of it? I loved this. I thought this was so good. I mean, I love a psychologically intense novel, which this absolutely is. I was quite dazzled by it as well. I thought it seems simple. It's deceptively simple, I think. And yet the complexity to what she's trying to pin down and somehow capture on the page was just extraordinary. You know, the ever shifting sands of this relationship, because no human relationship is ever static. And somehow she managed to weave this net in such a way that you ended up understanding so profoundly the mother's point of view and the daughter's point of view and feeling sad I felt you know your own emotions are engaged I suppose the sadness comes from the lost potential you know what that relationship should be and how important it is and this book really looked at what happens when you don't have that the absence or the loss Maybe not so much loss because in this relationship it's never really there, but then mm. that sense of missing out and ultimately just how sad that is. Mm. And it doesn't sound like an enjoyable read, but it's one of those books where the pleasure is all in the writing and how it's done. It was so well done. I really enjoyed reading it. We talked in book club a lot about the dialogue and how we hadn't encountered someone who could just capture so much when people are talking about nothing and how there's these really painful interactions between adult, child and mother and you feel like you're in the room. Her mother hurts her knee and so she travels up to Liverpool or maybe it's Manchester at that point because her mother moves to look after her and it's just exquisitely painful and her mother is always looking for a fresh start. She's always kind of trying to be more and to reach out to people but she can't make human connections so she's out and about and trying to live this life but there's no friends there's a second husband after she divorces her first and then her daughters both daughters we should say don't speak to her and then crucially the two daughters Bridget and Michelle Michelle's the sister they don't speak to each other and so there's this deep sense of maybe trauma is too strong a word though we talked about whether or not it is trauma maybe there are darker threads here that our narrator isn't sharing with us the father is alluded to. At one point, Bridget presses her mother about allegations that may or may not have been made against their father. And was that why their interactions with him were initially through a contact center? I had to Google this, but you know, a mediated session. And at one point, her mother alludes to potential abuse, but it's all then just sucked out of the dialogue. They won't engage with it. And because we're only hearing the narrator's point of view and also what she wants to share, we don't know. So this, despite it being very mundane in terms of domestic life and interactions, there's a real sinister edge woven all the way through, as well as some very funny moments. Brutally funny. Brutal was a word we used a lot. I'm thinking of when she takes her mother to the vegan cafe for her birthday in London, and her mum <laughs> refuses not to eat this like keto salad of just like raw carroted beet and cabbage. And it becomes a battleground. Her mother is going to finish that salad no matter what. And it's just so painful, but so well done. I didn't find it funny, I have to say. That's a surprising, yeah, left my own devices. I would never characterize it as that. It's not to say I didn't enjoy reading it because I did very much. But yeah, I, I 
Well, not laugh out loud. No, I think I was so focused all the time on the sort of psychological warfare and the push-pull the whole time. And to me, it was, yeah, it's, I found it quite a serious book, I suppose. In a way, I probably perhaps could have done with it being a bit more funny, you know, because it's, it's a lot, you know, you have to really go on this journey with these characters. And for me, there wasn't much light relief. I would have liked the sister to have been a bit more involved. That felt like a little bit of a flaw to me, the fact that she was as distant, seemingly, from our main character. But that, for me, just thickens the mystery. Yes. And also, it makes you increasingly suspicious of the narrator. Yes. Why is she estranged from her sister? And when they have this conversation, her mother's in hospital and the narrator won't go up to see her mother right away because she has a conference. Mm. And this interaction between the sisters, you're like, oh, wait a second. Our narrator is the bad sister. Michelle's doing everything she can. She's bending over backwards. She's seeing her mother more regularly, although obviously with her own baggage, whereas our narrator has retreated into her own version of events. Yeah, I mean, I like it. And I think, yeah, as you say, you could see why she does it that way. Did you not notice the details of crap England woven through? So at one point, she's sitting in a Cafe Nero in a house of Fraser near a hospital in Northern England. And we're just like, oh, God. I mean, this is just England. You know, I hate England for all those reasons, too. You know, (laughs) in many ways, just a a rubbish place. Exquisitely, exquisitely portrayed. Her mother moves into that apartment block in downtown Manchester, and it's just filled with students. And she thinks she's going to have this glamorous life downtown. And I know, having lived in some student halls in England, you know, that kind of industrial barf proof flooring and the doors and just all these little details and the pizza flaps in the elevator and it's all just so tragic while also feeling quite banal yeah the thing i thought was almost like the truth to it was so extraordinary because as you say that is a deeply recognizable and relatable portrait of england i, I absolutely and what's the word, exactly was able to place these characters within the very codified social hierarchy that we have here. And I guess everywhere does. But when you're from a place, you can really read it. And it was completely clear and exactly right. Mm. And as you say, her way with dialogue and being able to situate these characters, it did feel very truthful. At the same time as you're aware, as we just alluded to, there are these plot contrivances that are allowing her to do what she wants to do. And so even as you're aware of them, and I was like, oh, I'd like to have seen more from the sister. But, you know, as you say, I completely understand why it was done in the way it was done. It's very assured. It's a very assured piece of work. You know, she knows exactly what she's doing. Every sentence is furthering the ambition of the book. And for me, it was very successful. I could just hear the voice of the mother throughout. And then the daughter's snide responses. And the father, too, even now... I'm like, I know this person. Who is this person? Who have I met? Who is this father? Mm, mm. But no one actually comes to mind. He's just so well drawn in his selfishness and in his mockery of his daughters that you feel you know him. And did you not think my relationship with my mother is nothing, thank goodness, is nothing like (laughs) the relationship that this character had with her mother. But nonetheless... After reading this, I was seized by a very powerful impulse to spend some time with my mother. It made me almost treasure the warm, loving (laughs) mother that I have and my relationship with her. And there's a real sense of limited time in the book. The book charts the mother's life. And I think being just encouraged to focus on that and be aware that time is limited and we don't know how much of it we're going to have. And somehow this book really maybe consider that in a way I thought was great. So would you recommend it? I mean, what was the overall response? I think Frances summed it up best when she said, it's an excellent read, but it's a brutal read. Brutal was the word that we kind of landed on, which might sound odd, but you feel a little bit like you've been kind of bashed around emotionally, I think, after you've read this book, a bit chafed. And and we were looking forward to something a bit different. And then we read Eight Months on Gaza Street, and we'll come to that. But (laughs) perhaps it wasn't quite as different as we had hoped. It's a very good book. We were surprised it hadn't been nominated for any big award, like it hadn't made the long list for the Booker Prize. And we wondered if that was because of the undervaluing of the subject matter. Yeah, that's interesting. It's always so fascinating, isn't it? The books that slip through the cracks. I do think it would be a good one for book club because it's not that long either, which sometimes is just helpful. Oh, it was so good for book club. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think I read it maybe in a day and a half. Mm. 
but there's so much to talk about. It's a really great book club book. I would highly recommend it. And although it's funny, this is such a Kate book. I feel like you would 100% have read this anyway, but it is not a Laura book. So I'm always grateful when book club forces me to read something I wouldn't necessarily pick up myself because that can be so invigorating to be pushed outside your regular reading habits. All right, well, we should move on to then your next most recent book club read, Eight Months on Gaza yeah. Street. Yes. Yeah, so we chose this in honor of Hilary Mantel's life. She passed away earlier this fall. And most of us, most of us, half of us had read the Wolf Hall series and loved it. I certainly loved that series, was slightly obsessed, but had never read any other Mantel books. And that's partially because everyone told me that her other books weren't as good and more specifically that they hated Beyond Black. Have you read that? I haven't. The only thing I know about Beyond Black is there's a very funny chapter in Andy Miller's book, The Year of Reading Dangerously, about his book club experiences. And Beyond Black turned out to be the book that broke his book club because he really loved it and the rest of them hated it. He was so nonplussed, like, how can they not appreciate this work of genius? So I think he couldn't go back after that. Yeah, I haven't read it, so I can't comment. But both Joe and Alice in Book Club yesterday were like, I hated that book. And I have heard that from other people. And so I kind of skirted around Mantel's backlist. I ordered a copy of Eight Months on Graza Street, waited, waited, finally arrived. And I was on the second page. And I just thought... Why have I been reading anyone other than Hilary Mantel? No one writes like Hilary Mantel. Why would I possibly think I wouldn't have enjoyed other books by her? It's so good. <laughs> Put it simply. So that's the review. What is it about? Let me take a step back. Hilary Mantel and her husband lived in Africa and the Middle East because her husband was an engineer. This was in the 1980s, early 1990s. Mantel was writing the whole time, although she hadn't achieved the levels of fame that would follow with Wolf Hall. And this novel was written after she had spent a period of time in Saudi Arabia. It's only autobiographical in the sense that she lived this experience. I say that, I'm assuming this. She was the wife of an engineer, as is our narrator, who traveled to Saudi and lived there she, I believe, lived in a compound. Here, it's a little bit different, and that's really where the plot kicks in. The audiobook is narrated by Sandra Duncan, and here's a clip. If you walk suitably dressed along the corniche, you can hear the sea wind howl and sigh through the sewers beneath the pavements. It is an unceasing wail, modulated like the human voice, but trapped and far away like the mutinous cries of the damned. The people in hell remain alive, says a Muslim commentator. They think, remember, and quarrel. Their skins are not burned, but cooked. And every time they are fully cooked, new skins are substituted for them to start the suffering afresh. And if you pick your way with muttered apologies through the families, ensconced on the ground, on the carpets they have unloaded from their cars, you will see the men and women sitting separately, one hunched group, garbed in black, and one in white, and the children playing under a servant's eye. The whole family turned to the sea, but the adults, rapt, enthralled by the American cartoons they are watching on their portable TV. A skin diver, European, lobster-skinned, strikes out from an unfrequented part of the coastline for the coral reef. Back on the road... The teenage children of the Arab families catcall and cruise, wrecking their Ferraris. Hot rodding, the newspapers call it. The penalty is flogging. A single seabird hovers, etched sharp and white against the sky. And a solitary goat faced Yemeni, his tartan skirts pulled up, putters on a clapped out scooter in the direction of Obhur Creek. The horizon is a line of silver and beyond it is the coast of the Sudan. Enclosed within it is the smell of the city's effluent, more indecipherable, more complicated than you would think. At the weekend, the children are given balloons, heart-shaped and helium-filled, which bob over the rubble and shale. On the paving stones at your feet are scrawled crude chalk drawings of female genitalia. Inland, Wrecked cars line the desert roads, 
like skeletons from some public and exemplary punishment. There's so much in that passage, isn't there? I mean, I think I had the same feeling as you when I started reading this, which is just Hilary Mantel. Like, why would you read <laughs> anyone else? You know, she's so good at just taking you to a place and evoking that place with all the sensory complexity of it in a way that's mm. so beguiling. And mm. I love that. I'm afraid I didn't manage to get that far through this. I hadn't had much time, so I'm a bit behind. Ah. But I am very invested in Francis and she's having an awkward time of it. She's just arrived and getting to grips with the strangeness of her situation. Her husband has just locked her in to their apartment, mm. which seems mm -hmm. slightly strange. And I suppose the other thing I'm responding to is that it feels very much that sense of Mantel's own experiences, her own observations. I'm very convinced by it. And I'm guessing that's where all that comes from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And what we haven't said, and it's why I'm sure you will keep reading, is that it's a thriller, right? That Hilary Mantel has written this atmospheric thriller about a relatively young woman's unraveling. I say unraveling. I mean, she's concerned that she's unraveling, that she's in this corporate apartment, this corporate flat. It's all beiges. And unlike most of the expats who are living in compounds, she's in a small apartment block. And so she has the ground floor flat. And then there's a family, a woman and husband, who live across the way in the other flat. And then there's a Saudi family, I should say, that they're downstairs. And then there's an empty flat upstairs. But is it empty? Because she hears a woman wailing one day through the pipes and there's mysterious people going up and down the stairs and she can't really go out. When she does go out, she's harassed on the streets, sexually harassed, really graphic, brutal language. And so she retreats back to this corporate apartment. She tries to make friends with the women in the other apartments. She's a seasoned expat. She's lived throughout Africa. And so she comes in to Saudi Arabia very open-minded. And she's constantly taking on these just really awful English men making these awful pronouncements about the women and the culture and the people. But something insidious is happening in that building. And yet her husband won't engage. He's preoccupied with building and that's the backdrop here is that the Saudi people are trying to build as fast as they can. And some of these buildings may never be built because the price of oil goes up, the price of oil comes down. So as well as being a thriller, it's a real study of expat life. And yesterday we talked a little bit about this reversal of the typical, highly problematic colonial experience of an expat, where you go perhaps to an ex-colony as an English person and you take with you that historical, I want to say baggage, it is baggage, but this kind of assumption of privilege, this assumption of power in your interactions. Whereas in Saudi Arabia, it's very different. You are there to serve and you are considered dirt along with all the other expat communities that are there. I use the term expat, you know, we tend to just think about that as Western people traveling to other countries. But there are communities of many different nationalities who have come to Saudi to build, to make money as fast as you can and try and get back out. And that layer too, there's this sick feeling that everyone's miserable and struggling, but they're just going to stay because the money will make it worth it until they can go back. And so life as we know it, life as we might value it, is on pause. So was it a good book for book club then? Oh yeah, such a good book for book club. Well, okay, it was a really good book for book club. I would recommend it. Now that said, it's so well done that we couldn't really pick it apart. I tried mm. a little bit. I said, you know, for a thriller, there are quite a few loose ends at the end. Did Mantel just not want to wrap those up because it might feel more commercial than literary? But it got shot down <laughs> by the whole group. And they're like, no, no, Laura, that's the point. Because one of the threads throughout it is that everything is unknowable. You cannot trust your judgment. No one is telling you the truth. The newspapers aren't telling you the truth. And so there's this low grade unease. Like, is there crime? People say there's no crime. Everything's rumor. Everything's hearsay. Nothing's verifiable. And so that's true in the ending. And the book club was very adamant that that actually is part of the book's genius. It's funny. It feels quite under the radar to me. I'd never heard of it. I'm just wondering whether it's the title. The title isn't great, is it? <laughs> no, it's not great. And I do think that people 
don't really know that much about Hilary Mantel's backlist. Mm. Or indeed, even her life, that she had this life outside of England for many, many years and these experiences. So it sounds like it's a recommendation for a read, maybe more than a book club book, but a high recommendation for a read. Yeah, the one thing I would add is that I passed it on to my mum, who read it and really enjoyed it. And she passed it on to one of her friends who spent seven years living in a compound in Saudi Arabia. She was a nurse, her husband was a doctor. And apparently, this is my understanding, she hadn't really been that interested in reading it, that she'd maybe been a bit skeptical about how Saudi Arabia would be depicted. But the feedback was, oh no, Mantel's really nailed the sense of the place, the feeling you had when you were there. And I thought that was really interesting. Like kind of claustrophobia, maybe. Oh, claustrophobia is the perfect word and that unease. Interesting. Well, I've got the rest of it to read. I'm looking forward to that, seeing how it all turns out. Did you have time to think about any recommendations? We've got a little stack of books to think of follow-ons for, but I have some thoughts. I do too. And maybe I could go first because it's a very natural follow-on. One of the things we didn't mention with Eight Months on Graza Street, of course, is their treatment of women and the fact that you are both invisible as a woman and you're also prey. Just by being present, you're prey for these men. And there's a lot of commentary about how for a conservative society, sex is always on the mind. You know, that's the problem, right? Women can't show any element of their body because it just jumps straight to sexual harassment or assault and how puzzling that is. So the book I wanted to recommend is nonfiction and it's Mary Beard's Women in Power, a manifesto. Have you read that? I read bits of it. It's such an easy read. Mm. You could sit down with a cup of coffee, finish it in an hour. Mary Beard is a classicist. She's very smart, very funny, and a very accomplished writer. In this book, she talks about the, paraphrasing from the jacket, the cultural underpinnings of misogyny, considering the public voice of women, our cultural assumptions about women's relationships with power, and how few powerful women resist being packaged into a male template. I was thinking that although this is very much tied to the Western world, kind of rooted back into traditions of Greek and Roman oratory, it would be an interesting lens to apply to Eight Months on Gaza Street and just think about women's position across different cultures, society, and religions. Hmm. Well, I don't have a recommendation for Eight Months on Gaza Street, but I did have a thought about my phantoms. I thought about a book I read a while ago that I really loved which is called Very Cold People by an American author called Sarah Manguso. It's set in a small New England town. Talk about claustrophobia. This is another good word for this book. It's narrated from the point of view of a young girl. And we learn that her mother seems to dislike her intensely. And her father is also quite a distant, unapproachable figure. Both adults are obsessed with their social standing in this historic waspish, I suppose is the word, New England town where status is really important. And our main character, Ruth, is observing their behavior towards her and towards others. From that kind of innocent perspective of a child, she's not judging them. She's just recounting what they do. But then as the reader, you have a very keen sense of just how, I suppose, badly they're behaving towards her and how wrong it all is, I suppose. And then as the novel progresses and Ruth grows up, we start to learn of the fates of other young girls in the town. And we start to understand that while Ruth has a quite specific set of concerns to do with her own very odd family dynamic, in fact, there are other girls in the town who are also suffering because of the way that certain men are behaving. And it's not to say that all the men that are depicted in this book are monsters. You know, there are occasionally examples of good, decent men. And when Ruth encounters them, she's very surprised because experience has taught her that that's not normally, that isn't normal for her, I suppose. It's another one where it's just very intense psychological dynamic and this family. It sounds like maybe it could be depressing, but I didn't find it that at all. I really, really enjoyed reading it. I read it, I wrote, the writing has an exhilarating sense of possibility and sentence to sentence, you never quite know where Mangusu is going to take you next. There is coldness here, yes, but also warmth and life. I loved it. Looking back on it, I'm happy to be thinking about it again. It was really good. It was really, really good. And I'd say almost, yeah, it has something of the precision and elegance of Gwendolyn Riley's book, but almost an American version that I'm sure to an American reader would be as culturally 
recognizable and specific as I found my phantoms as an English mm. reader. That sounds really interesting. Maybe to jump to another mother-daughter relationship in the Southern Hemisphere, we should just quickly reference Cold Enough for Snow by Jessica Au. We mentioned that on the Fitzcarraldo episode because it's a beautiful slim sliver of a Fitzcarraldo edition. And that recounts a mother-daughter trip to Japan. And it has a lot of the unspoken, not even tensions, just the unspoken nature of a mother-daughter relationship as this young woman and her mother travel around Tokyo. I loved that book. Yeah, it's, you did too. it's much gentler in a way. It's not quite so yeah. um, forensic, I suppose. No, but... no, no. And, and I say it's as good. Mm, I think it's close to being as good, but very different. Mm. And it shows you just how much there is in that relationship to really examine. Yeah, and another one I think that triggers you to perhaps think about your own family relationships. Still waters run deep with that one. And finally, mm. Seven Moons. I was thinking about you know, a lot of that book is concerned with violence and political struggle, the ongoing conflicts in Sri Lanka, uh, the civil war. And it made me think, I remembered The Ministry of Upmost Happiness by Arantati Roy, which we actually did for a book club book. So we did do an episode on it back in the day. It tells the story through the lens of these two main characters. We meet Anjum, who is an intersex character, and she's an outcast who eventually finds a place for herself among the Hijra community. And Tilo, who's a young activist in the struggle for Kashmiri independence. And so the backdrop to this story is this ongoing conflict arising from the partition of India. And so going back historically, but with repercussions that continue on to the current time of the novel. It's got that same mix of being quite a character driven story, but with this backdrop of politics and violence. And I think some of the same sense of frustration and despair at human beings and what context will lead people to do in the way that people behave. And as with Seven Moons, there are a lot of characters in the Ministry of Utmost Happiness who really are morally reprehensible. And Roy picks her way through that. And she is a very politically active and engaged person. She always has been. And I think reading this as someone outside of that, who doesn't know so much about history, isn't so intimately connected. I suppose, with that country, you know, there's much to engage with and there's much to interest you. And I found it a very absorbing story. I am guessing that for people who do know more about that political situation, it would perhaps be problematic. Maybe it would be something that you would want to champion. It's just interesting that as with Seven Moons, there's an audience who know and understand their own country and their own country's history and have that perspective on it. And then there are outsiders, people from the wider world who are learning about it through the lens of this book. I thought, as with Seven Moons, it was such a rich, ambitious book. I think it suffered slightly, and poor Aaron Tati Roy, you know, it's her own fault for writing a perfect book. It suffered very much by comparison to The God of Small Things, which is the book that she won the book of for many years ago. Is it 20 years ago? That book was such a huge hit, and people all around the world, read it and fell in love with it. I reread it not so long ago. I think it is a perfect book. I would urge anybody who hasn't read it to seek it out. This book is not that. This book is sort of messier somehow. And I don't think it always works, but it's so, in its own way, excellent and really a worthwhile read, a rewarding read. And I would recommend it. Yeah, I would recommend that as a book club book. Yes, for sure. absolutely. Absolutely. It's a great yeah. discussion book. I would be remiss if I didn't make yet one more plug for A Passage North by Anouk Arad Pragasim. I've referenced that a few times on the podcast because it was shortlisted for the Booker Prize in 2021. And what a novel it is. Kate still has not read it. How did you know that? I might have read it. I might have read it. As it happens, I haven't yet read it. But... Well, it's it's such an interesting book. She it knows is me not very the type well. of book that I would think I would enjoy. Um, the first 70 pages, you go with the narrator on a walk through Colombo. For 70 pages and he's musing and he's remembering and he's thinking about his grandmother's health and the state of the country for 70 pages <laughs> and yet if you can devote yourself to this book if you can give it the time you are just lulled into a different pace of reading and I a year and a half later can still 
think about this book in great detail, about the moments, about the pictures that were painted in my mind, about that walk that we went on together. And I don't know that it should have won the Booker Prize, but I recall that both Phil and I thought it would have been a very, very worthy winner. The Promise was too, but I think this is an exceptionally beautiful novel and very complimentary to The Seven Moons of Mali Almeida because it is considering the impacts of the Sri Lankan Civil War. And our narrator travels north to attend the funeral of his grandmother's carer who has killed herself, having lost children in the conflict and finally, I think, deciding after years in Colombo that she just had enough. And so it's very sad and melancholic while also being strangely beautiful and uplifting. We've got our Christmas show coming up and I've been thinking about how we're going to divide our recommendations, our favourite books that we read this past year, 2022. And one of the categories I was thinking of having was the one that got away, the book that you should have read, (laughs) but for whatever reason you didn't. And I think it would be fair to say that A Passage North is the one that got away from me last year. (laughs) I just didn't manage to read it. I feel like now the wheel of time and reading has moved on. I, I think I'm probably unlikely to go back there. Maybe I would. I'd like to think perhaps one day I will. Maybe you need to wedge it in as a book club book. Yes, that is often the way. Another reason to love book club. It gives you that little kick to read books that otherwise might pass you by. Well, such good book club books today and lots of great recommendations there for you two listeners. Thank you so much for joining us. And as Kate says, we have our Christmas special coming up in a couple weeks. And Kate has a slightly bonkers list of criteria. We'll be joined by regular guest and dear friend of the pod, Phil Chafee. We're excited. I'm excited. Can't wait. That's nearly it for this episode. Books mentioned were Women and Power by Mary Beard, Very Cold People by Sarah Manguso, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness by Aaron Tati Roy, Cold Enough for Snow by Jessica Al, and A Passage North by Anouk Aradvagasan. The audiobook of Seven Moons is published by Belinda Digital. My Phantoms is published by Granta Audio and Eight Months on Gaza Street is published by WF Howes. And all three are available via your preferred audiobook retailer or library app. If you have thoughts about this episode, whether you listen when the show goes out or at some moment in the future, assuming the internet is still up and running, you can get in touch to share them via the episode page on our website, thebookclubreview.co.uk, where you'll find full show notes, an episode transcript and our comments forum. Have you read any of the books we discussed today? Let us know your thoughts or tell us a book that you would recommend. For reviews and recommendations between episodes, come and find us over on Instagram at Book Club Review Podcast, on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod, or email us at thebookclubreview at gmail.com. We always love to hear from you. And finally, if you've enjoyed the show and want to support us, please do leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts. The ratings really make a difference in helping other listeners find us, as does you passing on the word to your book-loving friends. But for now, thanks for listening and happy reading.